Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike and in this old video what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the yogurt shop murders. In December 1991, a yogurt shop in Austin, Texas was robbed and set on fire after four teenage girls were murdered inside. And the case remains unsolved to this day. It's been 28 years since it happened and there were many twists and turns in the original investigation. So, well, well, what's going on? What happened? Well, let me tell you what happened. In the date was December 6th, 1991. Baby Mike had just turned one year and one day old. Yeah, let's make this all about me. Shortly before midnight, a patrolling Austin police officer saw a fire coming from the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt shop, located in a strip mall in the 2900 block of West Anderson Lane, which is now a classy nail spa. Firefighters arrived on the scene, and, well, after the blaze was put out, a horrific crime scene was discovered. The lead detective would say, For a long time, I shut out what I saw. Just wholesale carnage. We knew immediately that they were kids. Okay, at 11.47, one of our patrol officers called in to dispatch smoke coming out from, I can't believe it's yogurt. Fire department got here shortly thereafter. What we found in the back there was we found four victims. We're handling it as a homicide right now because it appears that one of the victims was struck in the head. Were the victims together or were they in different parts of the building? Can you, can... No, I can't. Can't give you that either. Were they bound in any way? Can't give you that. Was there any sign of forced entry to this building? Can't give you that. What can you give us? Just what I gave you. How it's still very early in the investigation, okay? Inside, the bodies of 13-year-old Amy Lee Ayers, 17-year-old Eliza Hope Thomas, 17-year-old Jennifer Ann Harbison, and her 15-year-old sister, Sarah Louise Harbison. Eliza and Jennifer worked there and were closing the shop for the day. Jennifer's sister, Sarah, and her friend Amy were there keeping the girls company. The last time the girls were seen alive was about 10 p.m. That night they were all planning to have a sleepover. At least one of the girls had been raped. Three bodies were stacked on top of each other. Amy Ayers, she was found in another part of the shop. All had been bound with their own clothing before being shot in the head with a 22 caliber handgun. It was an absolutely horrific crime. The autopsy revealed the probable use of gasoline set to, you know, kind of start the fire. It seems that the killer placed all four of the girls on top of each other, started the fire, and left the scene. Amy survived the initial gunshot and she was shot again, but after being placed on in the body pile, she managed to to crawl away while the uh, building was on fire and she was found just a little bit away. Firefighters would find her 30 minutes after they arrived on the scene. It's hard to know exactly how much was stolen. Not that it really matters in the context of what fucking happened. It's believed to be about $540 though, but I'm not sure if that really matters. You see at 11.03 p.m. three minutes after Eliza and Jennifer closed up uh, the shop, the cash register rang a no sale tag, or whatever you call it. And it's believed then that, uh, the police believe then that's when the suspects pocketed 540 bucks. Not sure if it's worth it. The Lanier School community, student body and faculty and staff have been saddened by the tragic deaths of four young ladies for whom we mourn today. They're grieving for their classmates. Three of the victims were students at Lanier High School. Today, the students tried to deal with the loss and their pain together. This is probably the worst, most heinous crime that has happened in the city ever. Students are encouraged to talk about their feelings. A team of counselors is at the school to help them. There are so many questions and fears now about things many of these teenagers never even thought about. I mean, they died and they were so, you know, they were our age and, I mean, it makes you really think, you know, tomorrow is a promise. And, I mean, anybody here may not be here tomorrow and it's just scary and it hurts. Man, I mean, you don't ever think anybody's going to come into a yogurt place. 
So who could have done something like this? Well, a retired police officer spoke to the police about a suspicious individual he had seen that night at around 9.30 p.m. This guy, he was wearing a green army jacket at the shop. The man was in the store for quite a while. At one point, he walked to the back of the store without asking permission. When the former officer asked one of the girls, what the hell is he doing back there? She responded by saying the man, he was just taking a piss. This guy then came back out of the restroom and sat down with another individual. Apparently he also bought a Sprite at one point, which is kind of the thing you'd buy if you were afraid you'd get kicked out and you're like, shit, I need to buy something. Ah, just give me a Sprite, yeah, was that a book? Yeah. You know, an excuse to stay there. Mm. After everyone cleared out of the store, these two individuals stayed behind until at least 10.47pm, perhaps even staying after the door had been locked. Then Jennifer and Eliza closed the store at 11pm, and then the, the no sale tag was rung up at 11.03pm, so possibly those guys they stayed behind were able to kind of forcefully stay inside the store, and then what happened happened. Those two guys, they've never been identified, everybody else in the store has been, except those two people, and the door to the, I can't believe it's not yogurt shop, was still locked when firefighters arrived, though they could have just gotten in the back door, so. The investigation, well, obviously it was, it was huge. Detectives quickly became overwhelmed with the amount of information they were getting. At one point, they had 342 suspects which is quite a few. At one point, authorities located and arrested Porfirio, Porfirio Villa Saavedra. Saavedra. Yeah, that guy. Uh, he worked as a delivery man for the, I can't believe it's yogurt, product sign. And they also arrested a guy named Alberto Cortez in Mexico in October 1992. This was due to a witness sketch resembling these two guys. Apparently they had a bit of a naughty history. Down over 700 leads. Tonight, for the first time, they've named three men they want to question in the murders. I want them to look me in the eye, and I want them to tell me why they did that. Their, their day's going to come. If I don't get to see it, they're going to have their, their day of facing someone. According to the Mexican police, Saavedra confessed to the November 1991 rape of an Austin woman, as well as to the yogurt shop murders. The two men were tried and convicted. However, they were later released from custody when they recanted their confession. See, the thing about their confessions, and this actually comes up quite a few times in this case, is um, they confessed to, to the yogurt shop murders, right? When police got a bottle filled with water and cayenne pepper and slashed it down their nose. So I wonder what that's like, but I don't want to try it. If anybody else has tried that, let me know. So that was a useless confession, I guess. A little over a week after the crime, um, some people came to the police's attention who may be of interest. Maurice Pierce was arrested for brandishing a 22 caliber pistol at a nearby mall. Maurice told cops he and three buddies, Robert <laughs> Springsteen, Michael Scott, no! and Forrest Wellborn, all teenagers, stole a car and went on a joyride the day after the murders. The ballistics tests, however, they were inconclusive. They couldn't connect Maurice Pierce's gun to the killings, even though it was the same caliber. The search continued, with $25,000 reward being offered. Six months later, it was increased to $100,000. Give us the information that will lead to the arrest and conviction of the person that murdered these girls, and we will give you $100,000 for that information. They had a lot of suspects, but one thing that really hampered the investigation was the scene itself. Due to the, um, the extreme heat and then the water from the fire hose, uh, it kind of made the crime scene useless. It was extremely contaminated. They, they wouldn't really get much out of it. But get this, a serial killer did confess to the crime. Kenneth McDuff, who murdered just a, he murdered just a shit ton of people, confessed to it on the day of his execution in 1998. 
He was in the area all right at the time, and it's kind of the sick shit he would have done, but he was ruled out. Are you sure talking to me bad? <laughs> His confession was most likely to try and get a stay of execution. That didn't pan out. Spoiler alert. Investigators actually got quite a number of false confessions, over 50, if you can believe it, but they, they were just that. It would be eight years before arrests were made. Early this morning, the Austin Police Department, with assistance from other law enforcement agencies, served four arrest warrants charging four individuals with capital murder. In 1999, well, wouldn't you know it, the gruesome foursome, Maurice Pierce, Robert Springsteen, Michael Scott, and Forrest Wellborn were arrested. On September 14, 1999, police took a written confession from Michael Scott, in which he stated that he, Maurice, Robert Springsteen, and Forrest Wellborn had murdered the girls. Due to lack of evidence, uh, the grand jury declined to indict uh, charges against Forrest Wellborn, and same to uh, Maurice Pierce charges against him, they were later dropped. Michael Scott and Robert Springsteen were convicted in late 1999 for the yogurt shop murders. What did Maurice make you do? Would that create a cop? What did he tell you to do? It was a and what's going to happen? What did you do? What's wrong? Okay, I'm aware. Okay. 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 The pair had confessed to the crime, saying they had committed the rape and murders while the other two stood watch. Michael was sentenced to life imprisonment. Robert, he went to death row. There was just one problem with uh, Michael Scott's confession. Let's see if you can tell what it is. Yeah, the detective held a gun to his head. The problem is, is we've got to get rid of our options. I can't give you any more truth than I've already given you. 
Where do we go from here? Why can't you? Because you're going to dig yourself into that thing? Well, you're already there. You've already dug the hole. The hole's there. Oh, then I'm in it. Uh, but I don't know. That's what I keep telling you guys. I mean, my God, this was seven years ago. But this is one of the most significant things that ever happened in your life. That's what I keep trying to explain to you. If I was there and I partook in this, I would remember these things. And you do remember these things. No, I don't. No, I do not. Now, you're the coldest guy I've ever talked to in my life. Are you a cold-blooded murderer? No, sir, I'm not. I, I think you are. I think Maurice is absolutely true about you. Well, then... Let's You're the coldest guy I've ever talked to. Let's take whatever actions we need to take. Pardon me? Then let's take whatever actions we need to take. If that's what you believe, and that's where you think this case needs to go, then let's go there. We don't want to go there. But I'm doing everything I can and have exceeded my limits of helping you guys. Where do we go now? But, well... It wasn't until 2006 that the convictions of Michael Scott and Robert Springsteen were overturned. Everyone is entitled by the Sixth Amendment to confront an accuser, but in the case of Michael Scott and Robert Springsteen, their confessions were used against each other. But they were never allowed to cross-examine each other at trial, and so their constitutional rights were violated. DNA would later rule out Springsteen. The other Springsteen. And the state would appeal the ruling that, um, well, they were kind of innocent. But because of this, they wouldn't be released until 2009, 10 years after they had been imprisoned. It's a new development this morning in one of Austin's most notorious unsolved murders, the 1991 yogurt shop murders. Now, the attorney for the man, once convicted and sentenced to death for the killing of the four teenage girls, is expected to be back in court this week. It's Robert Springsteen. He was one of four suspects in the case. He's now seeking a judge to declare he is innocent in the case. A ruling in his favor would make Springsteen eligible for at least $700,000 for the time he served in prison. His attorney is expected to make his case this Wednesday before the third court of appeals here in Austin. Springsteen was convicted in 2001, but it was later overturned after DNA evidence. But Travis County prosecutors say he remains a suspect and he could be retried for the murders. That's if investigators find even more evidence. Now, out of the four suspects arrested in this case, only two were convicted, Springsteen and Michael Scott. Both of their convictions overturned years later. We'll keep you posted about the new development that we find out in this case. Funnily enough, well, not really. But in 2010, one of those lads, not the ones who went to prison, Maurice Pierce, who was arrested, he died in a traffic stop gone wrong in Austin. Two officers pulled him over. And after he did a legger, one of the cops caught up with him. In the struggle, Maurice pulled a knife and stabbed the officer in the neck. The officer then went up to him, pulled a gun, and killed him. The officer survived. Can't say the same for Maurice. And that's kind of to date. Uh, the Austin yogurt shop murders are obviously a cold case, but it is still a case. So this when we walk in, we see the girls' pictures, we see the images of the yogurt shop and the scene. It's a reminder at the beginning of our day, at the end of the day, of what we're here working on. We're working with the Travis County District Attorney's Office on a regular basis moving forward on this case and conferring with and meeting with members of the scientific community that are schooled in DNA, that understand the current technology that's available, the current tests that are available, how we could try and identify this sample that you're speaking of. The issue that we run into now is that the sample that we have is not of a quality that we are able to utilize those technologies today. It's our hope that the technology will catch up and be able to process the evidence that we have in this case, or that we'll find a new piece of evidence that may come forward from someone. The good thing is, I think there's people out there that could help us. You know, I think, you know, we are still interviewing people. We still get tips on this case. And I think that's a good, important thing to remember that, you know, with a case like this, we believe there's someone out there who could know something that could be helpful and uh, could be helpful to this investigation. One of the detectives who was involved in the case says that he believes Scott and Springsteen were involved somehow in what happened on December 6th, 1991. He says this because 
they have both said things that were never released to the public. They know something that no one else knows. And the two guys who were in the shop till closing time, most likely the last people to see those four girls alive, remain unidentified. And in 2009, DNA found on one of the girls was that of an unidentified man. So whoever did this, people who did this, they're still, they're still out there. Thank you so, so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, if you'd like to watch some more of my videos, please work away and I will see you as always real soon in the next video. Thanks again for watching. Take care of yourselves. Mike out.